thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, we've got uh, Chris Fettweiss here from Tulane University mm -hmm. um, to uh, offer us a conversation on uh, the U.S. interests and uh, the war in Ukraine. And without any further ado, uh, Chris, please yeah. go ahead. Andy, thank you want to hit the end button? <clears throat> well, thank you everybody for having me here. Professor Stiegler asked me to confine my remarks to three and a half hours. I'm not <laughs> sure I can do it because I have a lot of fascinating things to say, but I promise there'll be time for you to say at the end, tell me why I'm an idiot, why I've gone wrong. Uh, and we're going to be talking today, obviously, about Ukraine and about U.S. interests. I'm going to basically be addressing three questions uh, in the course of this talk. Uh, how did we get here? Why did this war happen? Where is it going? Where, where's it, how's it going to end? And then what are the implications for the future of the international system? Uh, and if that's not enough, all along the way, we talk about U.S. interests and how it relates to what we're doing. But I'd like to start off with this, one of my favorite Ukraine maps. Washington Post asked people to put a dot in Ukraine. Uh, some of these disturb me. Uh, I don't know what it is. But this is sort of the average cross-section of people. Uh, some got it right. And I like to think this audience knows more or less where Ukraine is uh, here. But some, there was also a correlation they found. I'll give you a second to read this. The more likely you were to know where Ukraine was, the uh, there was an inverse relationship, the less likely you thought it was important, or at least important enough for U.S. troops to be deployed. Uh, this, I don't know, there's a lot of things that this could, if you think about it too much, it'll depress you. Uh, but yeah, there's a, it's corresponding type maps to North Korea, Iran. People don't know where the heck anything is. But if you don't know where the heck stuff is, you tend to be more hawkish. Uh, this we're going to be talking about today and some of the framing that's going to be going on in this talk. And we're going to be talking about our tangible interests and at the same time, what we you might call it intangible, but also imaginary interests. Interests where we have to think about them. We, we thought about it enough and come up with an interest. It, or if we thought about it enough, we could start worrying about it. We th if we think, for instance, that the Chinese are going to be learning a lot from what's happening in Ukraine. Then it's going to detect and it's going to shape what we think we should do in Ukraine. If, we're talking, if the Iranians are watching what we do, but this is also the part of our imagination. Uh, we have to think, uh, imagine what Putin is thinking. Will Putin stop at Ukraine? Will Putin go into Moldova next? By the way, I don't know how many of you have been to Moldova. Uh, it's not going to be a big shift in the balance of power if he gets Moldova. <laughs> but we'll talk about this as we go along. This is going to be in the background. Uh, if, as I'm going to say, it's just kind of what we call in my business a realist. If we focused on our tangible interests, what we actually, the, our actual security and prosperity and our, our freedom and our prosperity and, and democracy, we're going to do a lot of different things. And if we get stuck up in the realm of imagination and what we think of, what are the kind of interests we can devise if we sit around and think about it enough? And sometimes I think back, I don't know if you guys still do. We used to do a thing when I was here. Uh, we talk about like what interests are you what are you willing to when we talk about interest in class what are you willing to die uh, for kill what are you going to kill for what are you going to spend for we had this i had an international officer from norway who looked like dolph lundgren and i have to explain today's students who dolph lundgren is <laughs> obviously i have to explain a depressing amount of information to today's students they don't remember a rock They've never seen Seinfeld or The Godfather, so all my references are lost on them. <laughs> but after I explain who Dolph Lundgren is, I say he laid out 15, 20 things he's willing to die for. And I asked in class, what are you willing to sacrifice your kids for? And he said, nothing. I think maybe as national security professionals, we ought to think a little bit that we have the responsibility, and I don't have too late, but people who are making decisions have a responsibility to think about what we're sacrificing our kids for. And I'm going to suggest to you over the course of this talk that that should be the tangible interest, not the ones we think of. We think of when our imagination goes crazy. But first, how did we get here? Why did this war happen? I know you guys have all been thinking about this for a long time. And there's people in my business who blame us. There are people who say about the mere, from the realist perspective and the liberal anti-American perspective, or anti-US government perspective, I should say, that it's our fault. That the United States brought this about, that our that is essentially expanding NATO, making Putin no choice, that it's all our fault. And you get other people on the other side of the coin basically say it's, it's our fault, but for different reasons. 
that, that we didn't send a message when he moved into Crimea in 2014 or Georgia, or when we pulled out of Afghanistan haphazardly, we, we put an idea in Putin's head that he never would have had. And either way, it's our fault. To me, I think this is all basically nonsense. That, that, that it's, it's not our fault. It's, it's something that a political scientist that just passed away, Robert Jervis, would call centrality. That we think we're more important in their decision making than we actually are. We're the center of our world, so it's kind of natural to think we're the center of their world too. And I don't think it, it, to this this whole argument that it's our fault to me strikes me as ridiculous and strikes me as forgetting the important difference between necessary and sufficient conditions, which I don't have to brief you folks on. But yeah, the expansion of NATO in my mind was a necessary condition for this war. It wouldn't have happened without that. And we'll talk about it in a second more. But it doesn't explain why it happened. Nine eleven. 9-11 essentially made this country crazy for six months, nine months, but it was still George Bush's decision to go to war in Iraq. It was a net, without 9-11, Iraq war doesn't happen, but it was still Bush's decision. Without the, without the expansion of NATO, this war doesn't happen, but it's still Putin's barbarous decision to invade his neighbor. He didn't have to do it. He has what we call agency. It's not our fault that he made these choices, but without the choices we made, it probably wouldn't have happened. We could have listened to this guy. And Chris Steele and I were talking to you earlier about how a lot of our senior foreign policy people are supposedly, everyone says how well respected they are, but they generally become ignored. George, uh, George Kennan, granddaddy in a lot of ways of containment and in a lot of US foreign policy during the Cold War, said this while the first big debate was going on of my graduate school career, whether we should expand NATO. In mid to late 90s. Cannon, and I'll give you a second, this is the wordiest slide we're going to have. So I apologize. But Cannon said it's going to screw things up. If we expand NATO, it's going to screw up our relationship with the Russians. And being the realist, that our relationship with the Russians is more important than our relationship with the Czechs or the Hungarians. But we ought to be thinking about great powers. And Cannon, I would suggest he was right. And expanding NATO, uh, I'll get back to those guys. Expanding NATO affected this guy and his generation of thinking in ways that we can look back now upon and say we could have avoided. It was a uh, unforced error. Putin all the time talks about three things that screwed up the relationship. He talks about NATO expansion, us leaving the ABM Treaty in 2001, and the coup in, you, in his mind, the coup that we engineered in Putin's mind. The CIA is behind everything. To, to a lot of people around the world, the CIA is like uh, witchcraft. I might have stolen this from somebody here. I stole it from somebody. The witch, witches in the, during the Middle Ages are assumed to be behind everything. Uh, uh, crop fails, it's witches. Uh, something's happening with my relationship, it's witches. It Burn some witches. Uh, the CIA is behind everything in a lot of people's minds today. It's certainly behind that coup and, or whatever happened in Ukraine in 2004. The CIA, Putin's mind. And he said right before the invasion, and I lied when I said it was a less wordy slide because we have a couple of wordy ones, but this is less wordy. Right before the invasion, NATO was on his mind. It was a necessary condition for this war. Uh, it, it wouldn't have happened if this guy wasn't obsessed with the West essentially sticking it in his face for the loss in his mind of the Cold War. Uh, the, and I, this is stolen from another talk I give sometimes. I mean, you need to understand a little bit about Russian strategic culture to understand why they would have thought this way. And in, in strategic culture, you know, is the stuff going on underneath that they don't talk about. Uh, this, this, the, the stuff that really drives foreign policy decision-making underneath the, uh, the water, this is where the realm of strategic culture, what makes them different from us? Or different, or what's unique about any country's strategic thinking? And the Russian way of war, we've seen it in, in, uh, in practice, mass, massing artillery, massing troops, massing the peasants essentially in the front line to get destroyed. And utter indifference to casualties, but also because they have a different history than we do, constant history of invasions, uh, one after the other, throughout history, some of which got to Moscow, some of which didn't, but all of which came from the outside. 
some of which came uh, without warning, especially the big one coming without warning, even though two and a half million troops are lined up on the border. Stalin thought, no, I can't trust me. Okay. But there was a surprise to many people in Russia, which has led to national levels of paranoia that we can't really understand here without understanding that they come from a different place. And they, the big effect we've had on that is pushing that paranoia to higher levels by expanding this alliance toward the East. Now, like I said, I first got into grad school, people were talking about this all the time. It was, and it was pretty much unity among the sort of com the com commentariat, the people in the foreign policy community said, this would be a bad idea, but we just went ahead and did it anyway. And a generation of Russians, was this guy at the forefront, who had just come out of the Cold War. It's hard to really grasp what losing does to the psyche and what losing a gigantic generations long conflict does to people. And it looked to him and his generation, not only did they lose the Cold War, but they lost the peace that occurred after because they couldn't stop NATO from expanding. They were kicked while they were down, which helps explain some of the stupid, weird sounding decisions, the seeming decisions that this guy and his coterie have made in the war the lead up to a the war in Ukraine. It's not our fault that we that you know, that this war happened. It's his fault. But it probably wouldn't have happened if we had if we made different decisions. This is only important now because there's going to be a lot of talk pretty soon about letting Ukraine into NATO. There's already talk going on in the outskirts, but once if this war reaches a lull at some point, there's going to be a lot of people saying the only way we can get it to not start up again is by letting Ukraine into NATO. That's going to cause a lot more problems than it's worth. It's not just an academic question, what we should have done 30 years, 25 years ago, because it's going to come up again. And expanding NATO would be as big a mistake or bigger than it was in the, in the 1990s. So that's the first thing you can tell me I'm full of crap about in a few minutes. But the second thing, it's clear how this is going to end, isn't it? I wrote a piece two months into this war. Chopped it around and I get the same reaction. I shop anything around. Who, who are you and why are you bothering? This piece? <laughs> but it, it, it's clear what's going to happen, how this is going to end. Uh, it's it's going to end with Ukraine giving up some chunks of its territory. Uh, it, it, it's not fair. It's not right. But international relations aren't fair. They're not right. It's not justice doesn't come into it. It's it's going to Ukraine is not going to get back. Quite, no matter what happens, to this offensive that started a couple of days ago. They're not going to get all this back, or if they do, they're not going to get it back for long, because the Russians aren't going to give up. Uh, political scientists have a great way of taking an interesting concept and making it horribly boring. There's a uh, interesting concept that they call audience costs, which is essentially just domestic pressure. And Putin would have too much domestic pressure to let go, to stop, to let this go back into the Ukraine's hands. Right now, nobody's there yet. Neither side is there yet, to the point where we're going to have to cede some territory. You, Zelensky couldn't make the decision to see territory without being overthrown immediately. Putin's not going to give up the idea of getting rid of the Nazis and whatever he thinks in Kiev. Neither of them are there yet, and probably tens of thousands of people are going to have to die before both sides get there. In my view, we're actually doing pretty well. The Biden administration is doing pretty well of uh, looking at our tangible interests here, which are not much. We don't, it doesn't matter to us. Who runs Donetsk? It doesn't. Or who runs the, the Crimea? It just doesn't make much difference. We can imagine how it's the beginning of a oh, European uh, conquest. We can imagine we're back here. But and I'll talk about where, where we can imagine in a second. Tangible interest here. What little. And the Biden administration's job is to manage this from getting and prevent it from getting bigger. And let both sides come to the conclusion that eventually this is, it's going to be in some kind of armistice line. Some chunks of these territories are going to go over to Russia. It's not right. As I said, it's not fair. But it's going to happen. Eventually, they'll get to that place. Kissinger says, said something very similar. Uh, he's just turned 100. Sort of morphing into a turtle. Uh, but, it, but, if you see, but he's still sharp. and still. And when he said this at a Munich uh, I mean, a, a conference a little while ago, he was followed by the Ukrainian president who said this. Constantly, what you hear is references to Munich and appeasement, especially out of Zelensky's mouth, who knows his audience. Uh, but the comparison to 1938 encouraging Hitler is ubiquitous. This conference has informed 
more of the thinking about Ukraine than it, than anything else. And I would suggest I've been writing and thinking about this. Like it's terribly misapplied in almost every situation, but certainly here. Better historical analogies, and I can give you hundreds of them. There's plenty of times when countries go to war and one country gets a big chunk of another country. The Romans took big chunks of Dacia in 1871. The Prussians took big, a big chunk of France. Didn't keep going. Uh, we took big chunks of Mexico. We sort of skip over this in history classes these days. It's sort of surprising to my students to find out that we took half of Mexico, uh, including some of the more productive bits of Mexico. We didn't keep going and take over. There, was, there are times in international politics, this happens. That there is, that, and one of the reasons that makes Putin's land grab different is it hasn't happened much. It hasn't happened much in the last couple of decades, which borders don't shift much anymore. They're going to shift now. And our job ought to be getting both sides to realize that Russians are not going to take over. Zelensky is going to be the president. It's going to be an independent Ukraine. It's not going to work. You failed. And Ukraine, you're going to have to give up some of your territory. Maybe you can make some kind of arrangement where you both uh, you share bits. You're not going to get Crimea back. Because if you, and here's, I like this map of Russian expansion over time. A little reminder that Russia is an empire. Everybody complained about overseas empires. Oh, that's how terrible you, colonialism when the British and French did it. The Russians were doing it at the same time, and they just held on to it. Uh, but a better preview of what's going to happen here can be found with the same actors, Chechnya, for a year and a half or so, the Russians mismanaged a war, did terribly, got beaten by Chechen rebels, and thrown out of a tiny province inside their empire, inside their country. But they came back. And when this guy took over, he, just, he engineered some terrorist attacks right near the Chechen border, and they attacked again and surrounded Grozny, the Chechen capital, which is the Russian word for terrible, by the way, if it tells you what they think of the Chechens. They surrounded with artillery, blasted it into oblivion, killed maybe 30,000 people, massing the artillery, not caring about casualties, but they didn't give up. And they're not going to give up in Ukraine. They're going to be back. Even if they get thrown out, they're going to be back. Which is why when they, if they do get thrown out, somehow if this, if this you know, offensive succeeds, there's going to be a lot of calls in this country. Expand NATO now. The only way to deter them from getting back in would be to expand NATO. I don't know how that's in our interest. I don't know how you can make a case for my kids, for the Norwegian officers' kids, that it makes a difference to who is in charge in Donetsk for our tangible interests. And uh, so that's going to be an, an issue to be aware of and a boy. It's also surprising to some people that the Russian, one of the reasons they're going to be back, this is a popular war. All wars are popular. When war breaks out, people rally around the flag. And I don't know what number 56 is, like all this I stole from the internet, so I'm not sure what this <laughs> is all about. But when, when there were people saying early on, oh, this isn't going to be a popular war with the Russians. Once they find out about it, they're going to throw Putin out. No, no, they're not. They're going to rally around the government. It, this, this effect doesn't last forever. And if it goes, if war continues on, maybe there'll be an erosion of Russian public opinion. This is also the polling data from one of the few independent pollsters that's taken seriously in Russia. There's a lot that aren't, that have, you know, in support in the 90s. And not, but the Russian people are behind Putin. You know, we don't know what numbers, but enough of them to say that they're not going to give up. He's not going to give up. The war is going to have to end with territorial concessions by Ukraine. And what that means to us is very, very little. When you talk about our tangible interests, what do we care where the border is? We'd only care, we think, well, what message did that send to Beijing? As if Beijing never thought about attacking Taiwan before this war happened. And now they're going to see how things play out. To me, it seems a bit crazy that Beijing would think, people, anyone in Beijing would think, well, if I, international pariah status looks look pretty good to me. Let's give it a try. Let's cut off all of our trade. With, we've essentially, the, the Russian economy is now teetering on the edge of oblivion. Not in there yet, but if it continues up, these sanctions continue on, they're going to be there. It's the Russians are not going to quit. So, how this ends, maybe next year, maybe five years, who knows? But it's, we know how this is going to end. Getting the two sides there is not going to be easy to do. Last idea for you the implications of all this. What does it mean? What does this war mean for US foreign policy, for the system moving forward? My sense is not much. 
not as much. There's all there's always talk. People always think we're right on the edge of a new a new revolution. 9-11 was going to be all system altering. Well, it altered defense budgets. I had a lot of lectures in here about how the uh, littoral, uh, littoral ship, what is it, the littoral uh, combat. combat ship would be good to fight terrorists. Okay. But it, it didn't affect the overall evolution of international politics in the long run. And it didn't affect system polarity. And there's a lot of talk now, oh, the U.S. reign at the top is over. I don't see any sign of that at all. That doesn't. It strikes me that it's it, it weird to think that this this war that the Russians have underperformed, done terribly, and a little bit of Western training has helped Ukrainians fight them off. This means that the U.S. position as the number one country in the world has been diminished. I write a lot about unipolarity, and this is a shameless plug. If anybody was interested in uh, this, is the uh, this is the Spanish uh, unipolar moment. But uh, this uh, throughout time, I, I don't see the big factors that led to U.S. dominance changing anytime soon. Um, we're talking about how much we, we're spending, our, because of Putin's war, we're spending, our, we've increased the defense budget by much more than the Russian defense budget entirely. And we spend plenty. Yeah, the Chinese might be able to challenge us in a region that happens to be right next to them for a little, and in this talk now, could the Chinese take over Taiwan? Flip it around. Could we take over Taiwan? Yeah, pretty fast. We can just send this. There's a big, there's a big dynamic. Yeah, China is becoming a regional military power, but there's one international military power. There's one international economic power. It's the, the the coalition of economic sanctions that the United States put together ought to show that we have a lot of power when we want to wield it. If we want it, how many we have? What 38, 39 treaty allies? I like to tell my students, give me the list of the Russian allies outside of the former Soviet Union. I'm going to give you the list. Syria, that's it. That's the list. That's it. They're, 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 what, the, what Chinese allies do they have? We have a lot. And as a result, this, we lingo from around here, they're a force multiplier, but it, sort of intangible things too. Patents, science, technology, still the leading country in the world. And the intangibles, everything from these stupid little things you might think of, but it become important internationally, like uh, Nobel Prizes, highest uh, grossing films, uh, cultural uh, factors. This is still a unipolar world compared to anything that has come before. Yeah, there's, there's challenges. We're not number one in everything. But compared to any other system before, we dominate the world like the Romans never dominated the whole world. Uh, we don't have an empire in that same way. Well, this is still a U.S.-focused world. And it doesn't seem to me to be changing anytime soon. There was a Foreign Affairs article just came out a few weeks ago, making this argument in more details. If you want some stats of how things were doing, I kind of like the foosball analogy here. Uh, I kind of like foosball. But it does from the Foreign Affairs article. If you're interested in more, I agree with these two completely. This is not the end of the U.S. era. In fact, it show the weakness of the rest of the world. Why would we think the Chinese would do better taking over Taiwan than the Russians were doing in Ukraine? The Chinese have no, they, the last time they attacked anybody outside their country, here's a good trivia question. When was the last time China attacked anybody outside the country? Yeah, yeah 1979. This is a, this, this audience gets that right away. My students, I might as well be talking about the, <laughs> the, the But they also did poorly, got out in a, a couple of months. Why would we think they would be better? Yeah, they spend a lot more money, but that's anyway a regional concern, not an international concern. So I don't think it's going to matter much to U.S. foreign policy. And there's something Rick brought up before. It's also not going to matter much to what is the most important phenomenon that's happening quietly, unobservedly, and if that's a word, in international relations, the decline of warfare. Doesn't mean war is impossible, obviously. Doesn't mean war that doesn't, that doesn't happen. But we are living in the most peaceful era of human history. And granted, I couldn't get something on the internet right-clickable to point it out here. It starts... This is essentially war in Syria, a little bit right there. Uh, and But overall numbers of wars, ethnic conflicts, civil wars, international wars are at all time lows. And I tell people this all the time and they usually it, they come at me with a couple of different things. Number one, you just wait, we'll come up with new reasons to kill each other, okay? Somebody will say, well, what about climate change? Okay, well, yeah, there's problems, but it does not, there, we, there's, and one person said one time, you know, I heard that the 
uh, traffic fatality rate in the Congo is way up. Well, okay, but it might be partially because the war in the Congo is mostly over and people are driving again, but fine, yeah, there's, there's problems. Or they just say, look, you don't know what you're talking about, you're an idiot. Oh, 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 okay, you don't understand warfare, maybe, but I understand that. And the battle casualties are way to think about the entire Western Hemisphere. It's at peace for the first time that I could find. And you might think, well, how are you defining peace? There's narco traffic, narco killing in Mexico. Yeah, but there's no conflict. There's no wars. The last war in the Western Hemisphere, let's see if I can get you on this one, ended in 2016. Where was it? Civil War. Colombia. Colombia. Colombia's, Colombia's national hobby, hobby has been war essentially since its inception. And that could end tomorrow. There's been rumblings. And there's been killings in Colombia. It's unstable. But it's better than it was. And all, all pronouncements about, about warfare are relative. This is, yeah, there's a lot of problems in the world. There's war. There's something going on in Ethiopia, which we don't know the scale of it because they keep the reporters out. But there's always been conflict in Africa. Dave Burbach and I, about five, six years ago, uh, had a paper analyzing warfare in Africa. And it's at the lowest levels in recorded history, even without factoring in population growth. Because this is all happening when there's not 8 billion people in the world. And 183 members, 193 members of the United Nations. There's a lot less warfare. I don't think this war is going to change much. I don't think there's too many people around the world going thinking, hey, Let's do what the Russians did. It seems to be going swimmingly for them. Let's give it up. Let's give it a go on our side. I think it's quite likely that we will look back on this conflict and see it, and it was 2000, see it not so much as the first shot in the new Cold War, but historians will probably look upon it as the last event of the last Cold War. The last event of this generation, seeing that they lost the Cold War and then they lost the peace when we kept shoving NATO in their faces and not cooperate, pulling out of every treaty unilaterally. For what reason, I don't know. Why we had to get out of the ABM treaty, and I know why. It teaches weapons of mass destruction courses, I said, I never told people, it's fun if you don't like people. That's a fun course to teach undergraduates. All right, so I know why we did it, but it screwed up this relationship and made and intensified this guy's already high propensity for paranoia. So we're gonna have some choices to make coming up in the next few years. As this thing unfolds, as the Russian, as the Ukrainian advance either sputters or keeps going, well, what to do to stop the Russians from doing it again, stop it from happening again. And I think the best way to do it is a settlement which gets Putin's people back home off his back, maybe Zelensky's people back home off his back, and keeps this thing moderate, at least, and, and uh, stops it from spreading not expanding our commitments. We expanded commitments to the Baltics. I love to tell people this. As of last fall, the three Baltic countries combined had zero combat aircraft and three tanks, old ones. The only way to stop Putin, if he wanted to get into Tallinn or Riga, where we have security commitments, would be put US troops, and maybe bigger weapons, ones with mushroom clouds in the way. When you start talking about thinking about national tangible interests, what the heck are we doing? How does that affect our freedom, our security, our prosperity? The things that a realist would tell you we should focus on. And it's not the case that we're letting Putin get away with this, that this is some kind of appeasement because it's gonna be, the Russians are suffering right now. I don't know if you've seen, but we have put on a substantial package of, of sanctions that has, is bringing that country and it's gonna to continue to bring it to its knees. Nobody's gonna to wanna to repeat that. We're going to, if I'm a betting man, and I'm happy to be a betting man, if anyone would like to take me up on it, this is going to continue. We're not going to, we have entered into a kind of a, a relatively peaceful system that's going to be difficult to change. Here's the latest final trivia question for you. To give you a sense of how different the world is than the Romans inhabited or the Mongols or anybody else throughout history. How many UN members have disappeared against their will? Not just imploded or divided, but been conquered by their neighbors. Zero. Zero is the answer. The closest we had was South Vietnam. But they weren't a member. They weren't a member of the UN. And Saddam Hussein tried to take over a UN member. He absorbed Kuwait. He got thrown out. Putin tried it again and has failed. It's, so we've had since 1945, zero 
conquest. Zero successful conquest. That's weird, everybody. We're living in a weird time. This is not normal that borders rarely ship, which is what makes this war so anomalous and so strange and so horrifying. Putin's trying to shift borders and he's going to get away with it. Short term or long term, it's going to happen. It would be better if we accepted it now. Uh, it, it's, it's, it, it, we, uh, uh, but we're living in weird times. We're living in weird times when the Germans, my people, are the most peaceful people on earth. That's weird. I mean, ask the French or the Poles or the Romans. The Germans are bad neighbors. Now they are the most people. These are different times. And I don't think this war is going to change that in the long term. I think historians, as I said, are going to look back. This is the last act of the Cold War. The last gasp of this generation of Soviets who couldn't handle losing. Losing hurts. And it hurts in ways you can't really grasp if you're not if you're on the other side. Because not only did they lose the war, but they lost the peace. So to conclude here, if we focus on these interests, and we're doing, I think, pretty well at it. I think the Biden administration has been keeping us restrained to some degree, but making Russia, making it clear we disagree, making Russia pay. But our main tangible interest is this thing doesn't get bigger. And, it's, and, and anything else, the things we worry about are in this front. Well, we can imagine things. Other people are learning issues. They're learning lessons that we might have to, um, that, that might be bad in the future. But that's up here. The Chinese, I've been quite closely monitoring what the Chinese are saying. They're never, they're, they're not saying, hey, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're learning a lot from this war about what we might do in Taiwan, but we can imagine they're learning it. Okay, focus on this, everybody, and we'll be better off in the long run. That's what I came to bother you about. I really appreciate you having me. I appreciate your time around lunch to uh, to listen to me. And now you can tell me where I'm screwed up. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Chris. Very engaging presentation, reminding us of America's core national security interests and how they may or may not be at stake in this. You know, that was excellent. Thank you very much. And no questions about my shoes, though. I'm kind of <laughs> okay. Right. Well, you did a good job of uh, <laughs> nullifying that <laughs> line of argument. Right. Uh, let me offer a couple of just to start things off, and then I'd like to open it up. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of rebuttals yeah. or, or other considerations, I suppose, yeah, yeah. more accurately. Um, you use the language necessary and sufficient. Yeah. And I could be sold, and I, in fact, I may be sold mm -hmm. that. NATO expansion was a necessary condition for this conflict that we're seeing right now. That is, it was unlikely to have occurred without NATO expansion. Right. My question is, though, and I noted that later on in the presentation, you did say war is Putin's fault. Yes. Could I ask what, uh, what you had in mind with that? Because I might argue NATO expansion might have been necessary, might have been a mistake, might have been a cause of this conflict. Mm -hmm. but is not necessarily the root cause that a lot of it has to do with Putin, his mm -hmm. demeanor as a leader, the state he has created over mm -hmm. more than 20 years now, mm -hmm. um, and that that has played a tremendous role in uh, generating this conflict and one of the reasons it has occurred. I would agree with everything you said, okay. except that if you remove NATO from that, I don't think the paranoia all those other factors are sufficient to explain what happened. All right. And I go back to the analogy. You take 9-11 out of the equation, the war in Iraq doesn't happen. But it's still, in my view, Bush's fault. That was a blunder that can be explained by the people in the White House. And it's the same with this war. It's, it's Putin. If Putin has the agency, it's his fault. But you take away what we did affect that calculation by maximizing his paranoia, by doing things to make it clear that we were going to be, in his mind, the enemy. Yeah. And his mind, you know, the CIA is behind everything, pulling stuff that hurts. Right. Yeah. Go ahead. The Biden administration was not in a position to reverse NATO expansion, right. of course. Right. You know, it was a commitment mm -hmm. uh, yeah. made decades before, in mm -hmm. fact. Mm -hmm. um, so if one argued that given the situation we had in mm -hmm. 2022, 2021, yeah. you know, that even if one recognized that NATO expansion might have been somewhat misguided, given the facts on the ground, a response to help NATO, something that might be, in, in terms of tangible interests, Ukraine is the largest country that is entirely within Europe in terms of land mass. Mm -hmm. And one might argue that has some geostrategic significance mm -hmm. and therefore minimizing Putin's ability to control even a portion of it 
is a goal that it might be worth pursuing and in fact embracing some risk to go after. And um, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily concern myself too much with Ukraine in the future, in the sense that uh, it, is it worth fighting for? I, is it worth spending for? Is it worth? Yeah, I think the Biden administration handled it pretty well, actually. Uh, I think it, making it clear where our lines are, we're not going to have U.S. forces shooting Russians, hopefully. And we're not going to be doing things to, to provoke further action, but making it clear that Russia has to pay a cost for this. That we're not happy about it, that Ukraine should stay uh, independent. And it's our interest, not primary interest, but it's it, it, we'd like to see them stay independent. We've supported them well. Uh, there's a lot of U.S. money and, uh, and uh, weaponry going in there and making life, Putin's life miserable and making this, this un, uh, unsuccessful. So I think we overall done pretty well. I also would say if I were Biden, OK, look, just for the future, having nothing to do with this war, uh, NATO's going to stay where it is for a while. We're going to keep that baby where it is. We're not going to be expanding Georgia, Ukraine, yeah, maybe someday down in the future. There's only one president who didn't expand NATO. And do a lot of Barack Obama, a lot of my people's mind, has a lot more in common with George H. W. Bush, the realist, that George Bush, George W. Bush expanded it as much as he could. That's what got us here. At least Biden could say this far and no further. Build like hey, uh, hate Emperor Hadrian. Um, one of my favorites. Everybody's got a favorite Roman <laughs> Emperor, right? That's not me. It doesn't mean I'm a nerd, right? Okay. He built walls, not so much to keep the barbarians out, because they were thin, but to keep the Romans in. And make it clear, this is the empire. And we're, we're going to go here and no further. Biden can do the same kind of message. No Ukraine, no Georgia. It, uh, to make it clear, to set Ukrainian expectations and uh, deal with the Russian paranoia. Yeah, anyone else? Well, just a yeah. right yeah. now, on that one. Just, uh, yeah. what did you, what's your position on uh, Finland and Sweden? Is, it, is, this, is this part of the wall? Like, that was just, yeah, that was further? essentially inevitable. Uh, once, once Putin... Putin's tanks rolled. I, I, I didn't have a great passion against that. Because number, number one, they bring actual capabilities. But the, number two, what do we need those capabilities? Do you don't need much capability, apparently, to beat today's Russia. But uh, that was going to happen. Uh, it was pointless to try to stop it, everyone, but you, once Russia did this. And it, that's also part of the cost that Putin's going to pay, a diplomatic cost uh, that, Putin, that NATO is going to take on two new members. That's not going to make him as crazy as talking about Ukraine or Georgia. If Finland, yeah, man, Finland might make him a bit crazy, yes. but uh, but not like Ukraine. And it, at least it, it's my perspective was like that's going to happen once this war started. There's no point in trying to avoid it. But you can avoid Ukraine. Yeah, Jordan, Jordan. online. So we have Theo Milanopoulos online. He was a student of Bob Jervis. So oh. I knew Bob. Yeah, there's two political scientists that I could never be nearly as good. Well, there's many, many political scientists I can't be nearly as good as. But the top two that I can, are, in my view, if you're looking for stuff to read, Bob Jervis and John Mueller, they write well as well as, as much as they think well. I think you've got the chat, maybe. Can you do that? Uh, no, I know. Uh, oh. Is there a way to allow him to speak? Yeah, or yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You might have it in there. You go. Oh, see, Theo. After all this, it's got to be a great question. Okay. You can yeah. type it in. Yeah, Theo. If you want to throw it in the chat, I'll uh, read it on your behalf. <laughs> uh, anyone else? Um, yeah. Sure. Uh, anyone else have any yeah. thoughts? Yeah, please. Can you opinionate on what you think it would cost to return the the uh, the wars to pre two thousand fourteen or two thousand eight? Is there a red line? You mean like what we should, what, what would it cost the Ukraine, Ukrainians, or cost uh, us? Or? Yeah, it would cost the West. Because they I don't know Ukraine can't do it without the West. I don't know how many Ukrainian sons and daughters they're willing to sacrifice. Yes. So get it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It, a lot is going to happen. It could be that the Russians fold in front of this offensive, and, and of course, for a couple of weeks, it could be that they had enough time to dig in that they're not going to. So I, what, it, it's possible. Is there we a could, red line, I guess, is there that I mean, would say no? It's I don't know. It, I don't know if it's worth it to do it because the Russians will be back. I don't think Putin can lose Crimea and then say to his people, "Well, we gave it a good shot, everybody." 
uh, let's talk about the Olympics. No, it is, it's, he's going to pay a cost at home. And what if people do, why? Maybe he gets overthrown. I don't know how more, closely you folks have been following. If Putin falls, what follows him might be worse. There's a segment of the Russian security community, which is worse. So the Russians aren't going to give up. And we can't make the Ukrainians not fight for their territory. But over time, they're going to probably figure out, they're going to make an assessment, they're going to get exhausted. Wars a lot of times end when both, times, both sides get exhausted. They just say, okay, enough. If, if it ends with Ukrainians kicking the Russians out of all their territory, the Russians will be back. There'll be a Chechnya situation. So I don't even think, I mean, is it worth it for us? Now? The, from our perspective, who cares who runs Crimea? It's not, it, there's no tangible interest there. But we can think about imaginary. There. So oh. offer a, a counterfactual here, yeah. if you will, that is it really not necessarily NATO expansion per se? It is really about Ukraine joining NATO. Yeah. And Maybe. that if that expansion had ended there and it was clear that Ukraine was not going to potentially become a NATO member, would Russia and Putin have still acted as he did? In the lead up to the war, a lot of people are saying, just make a pledge, Joe, uh, President Joe, that Ukraine will never get. And I think back channel, we might have made quite made it clear, but Putin didn't believe it. And he and I, it, 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 you know, the speech is a couple days before launching the war. We know that Ukraine's going to be in NATO. And he never believed that we would keep him out. You're probably right that did. Ukraine is the, the absolute line for him. But do he, would he believe, even if he thinks, no, nah, I can trust Joe, what happens What happens if the next guy becomes the last guy? Is he going to live? Who, who, who knows who's going to be president next? You can't trust what the United States is going to do. I don't think at that point it made any difference. The, the, the harm had been done. Yeah, Tom, and then we've got Theo's question. Go ahead. Yeah. Sure. Hey, Chris. Excellent. I agree with you fundamentally about everything that you said. But again, another, yeah. let's look at the other side. Uh, expansion of NATO. Mm -hmm. Every time we expanded, I sat there. I did NATO. I right. Did, I didn't like NATO expanding. I offered all the realist arguments. Mm -hmm. But now I look back and I say, how many allies does Russia have? Right. Syria. How many allies does the United States have? A whole big bunch. Yep. Yeah. Uh, when we expanded, the American uh, public opinion was supportive. Mm -hmm. More importantly, the Czech public opinion was supportive. Czechs and Hungarians and all these people are looking at America as a country that kind of seems to care about their domestic politics. Yeah. So it might have nothing to do with realism, but the fact that NATO expanded for domestic reasons, I would say, more than realist reasons, Maybe it was a success. Russia sitting there by itself, and we're sitting there with an army of allies. Good job, NATO expansion. I guess so. We have an army of allies that include the Albanians and the Estonians and the Latvians. I, okay, and the Czechs love us. Great. Uh, yeah, this is good. It's better than have the Czechs hate us. They're good hockey players in particular. But what else do we get from this? Are we safer? Are we safer than Hungary is our NATO? If we get attacked by the Mexicans. Albanians will be at our side. Well, okay, but we, we, uh, too much conversation in this in our, in our country. Good NATO be, has become an end, not a means. Alliances, as you guys, I'm sure, still talk about ends and means, grand strategy. Alliances are means to the end of security. Some kind of goal. You put an alliance together to get to that goal. It has become that NATO is our goal. We'd have to fight for NATO if Estonia gets attacked. Well, because if we don't want NATO to go, NATO would become the end. What are we talking about? What, what, why? What? We've lost our minds if the alliance becomes more important. The alliance itself becomes the end, the goal, and the important thing, our interest. Our interest is presumably served by NATO, not NATO itself. So if once fighting, once NATO becomes the interest, we're in trouble. And I, all those things you left, right along, absolutely true. We have more allies now, but I'm not sure that we're safer or secure any if met our tangible interests. Yeah, the Bulgarians love us. Great. You know, I, I prefer that than hate us, but it doesn't help day to day. So I'm I remain skeptic. Got a question from uh, Theo Milanopoulos. He says, I wanted to follow up on Andy's question about NATO expansion as a necessary condition mm -hmm. to provoke Putin to con conduct this invasion. 
This implies that the absence of NATO expansion would not have promulgated this invasion. Do you believe this is true? And let me offer a different counterfactual similar to Terry's question. Mm -hmm. If in 2008, the United States had admitted Ukraine immediately into NATO, instead of promising entry into some future date, would Putin have been deterred? That's a great question. And it seems to me that if you're Putin and NATO is expanding, and it's gonna take a few months for NATO expanding, you might act before him. You might act preemptively to stop it from happening. And let's say that he does this knowing that, are we gonna sacrifice New York for Kharkov, for, for, for Kiev? Are we gonna, during the Cold War all the time, would we, would we really sacrifice New York for Hamburg? Well, would we sacrifice today New York for Riga? Or for, would we go to war? Would he have essentially, as I'm saying, call our bluff? Or would he have to choose to fight in Ukraine or what? I don't know. Be, but because we made a security commitment. And I, the answer to the first part of the question, if we hadn't expanded, I don't think this war would have happened. I don't think Putin would have felt quite the same level of paranoia. And let's say it did happen. Let's say he did attack. There's no reason we couldn't have acted exactly the same way we did. It's not the case that NATO was a, a precondition for our aiding the Ukrainians. We could still have pumped uh, dollars and weapons into Ukraine just as easily without the NATO commitments all around the periphery. I used to love when I was here, I still use this, uh, this scenario. When we did UCOM in the days of UCOM, uh, but we'd have a, uh, I, I showed at the little city of Narva. Narva is the third biggest city in Estonia. It's got like 90,000 people. It shows you how small the country is. But also, it's something like 80% Russian. What if the Russians decide we're taking over Narva? And uh, we have the uh, common nationality. We're going to take over Narva. We have to decide whether we're going to fight for Narva. And if you're Putin, might you calculate, they're not going to do that. And this will destroy NATO. This will destroy the NATO commitment if we don't. We have to determine, decide whether we're going to try to stop the Russians from getting into Narva, which no Americans could find on a map, even the people from Narva. And so it's, it's, it's we have the hell of a choice to make. And it's that, that we've gotten to this position because of our choices. We didn't have to make a commitment to Narva. We could have stopped it. And it'll be, right now, we should say, OK, no more. Let's put Hadrian's Wall around NATO now and move on with our lives and pretend it didn't happen. Bringing, so talking about bringing in Ukraine is going to make things worse. Theo's got a follow up, and then we can uh, come around. Additional question, since in the time it took me to type versions, <laughs> <laughs> you pointed to the Obama administration as the outlier on NATO expansion. Mm -hmm. But the officials from the Obama administration are now in the Biden administration yeah. and have said their inaction following aggression in Crimea forced them to learn hard lessons they didn't want, they don't want to repeat now. So what do we make of the learning they've done from their own experience on this front? It's true. And they, one of the big NATO expanders, a guy I went to, when I was in graduate school at, at Maryland, there was a guy, Evo Dolder, who was teaching there. And we it was during these big debates, and he would make the case that, oh, this is not about security. It's about Central European stability. It's about trade. It's different. It's not your father's NATO. And he became the ambassador to NATO under the, uh, the uh, Obama administration. So there are people... If there's a lot of liberals and a lot of other NATO expansion makes a lot of strange bedfellows. And a lot of liberals think we had to do this in order to expand these circle of democracies and things that make us feel good. But I, I disagree with all those people in the Biden administration who have hopefully they learned different lessons. And I worry a lot because I think those people are going to be at the vanguard of saying the way to stop the Russians from coming back is to put Ukraine in NATO and deter them. Without thinking, what happens if deterrence fails? Do we really want to go to war for Ukraine? Seems to me the answer is no. Of course not. What are you crazy? But we're really going to stick our feet in it if we expand. Now, so I worry about what Theo was asking about. That people learned, oh look, we should have expanded NATO more rapidly. What? What universe are these people living? And are we going to have to continue to do it and continue to say our sons and daughters are going to be risking themselves? for Tallinn, for Kiev, for intra-Slav conflicts. Slavic people are like the Germans. They're excitable. They get into disputes. Why do we have to get in the middle of it? And I would just say, if we do focus on our tangible interests, we won't. Uh, Brian, you had your hand up, and then we'll come around. Yeah. 
Hey, so I'm a 20 year practitioner, yeah. you know, aspiring scholar. So yeah. forgive me yeah. if, I, uh, if I'm not on point, but I, you know, we, we look at a lot of, you know, interest based, mm -hmm. you know, wars, right? And as someone that spent 20 years as a practitioner mm -hmm. being deployed, you know, to fight for our core national interests, um, I've, I've had to struggle and, and reconcile, you know, the difference here between these tangible and imaginary interests. Yeah. One thing that I don't like about the way that we teach, you know, that the kill for, die yeah. for, pay for, and I agree with you, we need to think about, hey, would you risk your sons and daughters? But I think it's dangerous to bifurcate, mm -hmm. you know, strictly between, hey, tangible and imaginary. And I'd be curious, you know, with a nation that was built upon a value-based interest, mm -hmm. right, much more than a security-based physical, tangible interest, where would you put, you know, our national security strategies got a third core value national interest, which is the realization, you know, promotion of democratic values and that freedom. Where would you bend that in terms of tangible versus imaginary interest? Because that is right at the forefront of what we're talking about. That's a great question. And I think, I, I, really, let's get a bad name because everyone thinks, oh, you don't care about democracy. You don't care about human rights. I think we responded pretty well to make it clear we do care about democracy. We just aren't willing necessarily to die for it. We've, we're going to be bringing the Russian economy to a halt over the next few years, essentially. And they're going to make their lives miserable and they're going to have to pay a price for having done this. I think this is totally appropriate. And they, we have a lot of tools in that kit. And we don't have to lead with the military all the time. And when somebody uh, violates our values, we can leave significant economic power and significant diplomatic power. We haven't been able to get the Indians and other people on board the anti-Putin train, but we have been a lot of a lot of countries. And we're making Putin and Russian Russian life miserable, or at least somewhat more miserable. They're all a lot of them are miserable beforehand, but more miserable. It could, we, we didn't say it's okay with us. And we've done quite the opposite, leading at the UN, leading it economically, but tanks uh, our main interest is not to see this thing get worse because if it gets worse, then human right, if the U.S. gets involved, how many more people are going to die? And not just our people, but it's going to get, with the iron law of, of international relations, things can always get worse. And our job ought to be managing this thing to make sure it doesn't get worse and making it clear to the Russians this is not okay. And I think we're doing that. But it's not, it's, I don't know any realist who think, ah, who cares about democracy? We're all what bands of democracy. We all want people to be treated right. Generally, anti-torture sentiments uh, pop up in realist camps too. But what are we willing to do about it? Should be the case. How much out of that? The kind of I mean, did you come up with that? What do we die for? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it, a. I don't think U.S. foreign policy is driven by national interest exclusively. Mm -hmm. Right. I sort of start there. B. We kind of came up with that notion mm -hmm. to apply some restraint. I mean, I would say I trace it at least to my right reading of the Weinberger Doctrine. Mm -hmm. Right. And and then I mean to help. He doesn't need any help. But but then you really have to sort of ask: Do do outcomes matter? Do results matter? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is yes, what is the track record? You know, the track record is pretty poor. And, and so at least I would say like my motivation with sort of that hierarchy is to try to add an emotional dimension when presidents decide to use military force, right? The track record of using the military or any intervention as foreign policy, it's pretty bad, right? So, you know, my, my answer to you, right, for your 20 years of sacrifice is, I'm sorry, right? We, right, we should have done better. We could have done better with our decision making. The reality is we, right, the, the administrations didn't, and that's across lines. Now, where I'll disagree with Chris a little bit, uh, or maybe I don't, Chris, uh -huh. is, I mean, you're really calling, right, with this and other work to have a, a stricter reading of national interests. Yes. And I think we would probably agree the U.S. does not actually use force based on national interests. Not enough. Not enough, right? Yeah. And, and so that, that's kind of like how we teach, right, is, is sort of how the U.S. government makes foreign policy decisions with FDA is all of these other factors. It's a cognitive factor. Because I think Chris even would argue, right, Putin was going to do this anyway for cognitive reasons. 
if it wasn't NATO, right, it's the right Kiev on Rus or, or right, we went to graduate school and it was about Milosevic and greater Serbia, right? I mean, that's really where we are. And, and so it's those internal cognitive factors. And then the external is oh, Putin has an external enemy with the US and NATO. He would have found external enemies anyway. It, it didn't have to be this NATO question. So maybe that's where we would sort of split. But I think ultimately, you know, this is right. It's a call to do more, right? Like, a stricter reading. Yeah, is it, if, if we focused on, if we, we don't always focus on tangible interests, like Derek said, but if we did, we'd bite a lot less. And if everybody, that's where realists are, I skipped over this one. I, I obviously found this on the internet somewhere. I don't know who the hell these people are. But the notion of good and evil, where we're, Putin's an evil guy. Don't get me wrong, but realists are really uncomfortable with the notion, talking about good and evil, because you can't compromise with evil. You can't, you can't lead, you can't make decisions thinking good and evil. Because uh, once you do, you can't, you know, if you want somebody's Hitler or Satan, you can't make, you can't compromise. And it's the so if we made our our decisions based on our tangible interest, if we remove the notion that we're the good guys, they're the bad, yeah, they're evil. We know that, but you can't make decisions on that way. So when when uh, when President Reagan said, you know, called the Soviet Union the axis of, or the evil empire, yeah, okay, what part of that do you disagree with? Sure, in a, in a level, yeah, there, but you can't think of it that way if you're the president. You have to deal with them as a, a country. Putin's an evil guy, but we can't think that way. When we, because otherwise it's going to shape what we decide. And if we did focus more on tangible interests, we'd do a lot less stupid stuff. But people like me, Kenan, roundly ignored. Although I like to put myself with Kenan. We're both ignored. We have, we, we get together. <laughs> uh, yeah, Paul, you had your hand. Yes. Uh, first, great presentation, very interesting, very provocative. I enjoyed it very much. Um, so, several issues. One, in your book, which unfortunately I haven't read yet. But I was, yeah, just a word. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I think you said that the unipolar moment is still with us. Yes. So does that mean American primacy is still with us? Yeah. Well, it depends on how you think of it. We can't, we're not the Romans where we can determine everybody's choices, but we're still the strongest country in the world by every meaningful and most unmeaningful so therefore, by that logic, we should maintain our alliance obligations. As part of the alliance structure, is, is, is essential. This is an essential element of the primacy grand strategy. If you think it's important to maintain, yeah, the point of unipolar moment. Okay. Well, British lost the unipolar moment. They're fine. Okay. Um, I had a student in this last term from Bulgaria. Yeah. And it, was, it, it changed the way I think about a lot of it. And he said, basically, well, talking here, this is not about. Communism, post communism, this is about Russian materialism. Right. And the Russians will never stop. So Ukraine is sort of simply one stop on a larger project. Right. So you either stop them there or you allow them to keep going and it becomes a bigger problem. So do you buy that argument? No. Yeah. I think that a lot of Russians would like to do that, maybe. They're not going to be able to do that. And then we're sort of imagining what they're going to do. Yeah. We're, we're saying it's 1938, we have to stop Hitler. We're all, it's always 1938. It's always, we're always at Munich. Yeah. And, and of course, your Eastern Europeans are going to say that because they want, don't want us to leave. They want to make sure NATO stays in East Europe. They, it's obvious why the Poles wanted into NATO. Yeah, yeah, I, you would too if you were in Poland. But we have to make decisions for us. And I, it seems to me, if, the, if if Putin gets some ideas, let's go into Bulgaria. And like I said about about Mount Moldova, if you've been to Bulgaria, you may think I, But the Bulgarians don't think that way, and they would. But we can. But we pose costs. Moldova is an African to the EU. I'm not sure what yeah. our application is right now. There, there's another yeah. sort of corollary yeah. argument happening within your argument, which is right. the, the European Union. Many of the states that have joined NATO are also simultaneously members of the EU or Africans yeah. who become EU members. And so yeah. the European project which we support yeah. because of its, uh, its democratization, human rights, et cetera, is something that is a, a sort of net benefit of yeah. expansion of NATO. So, so it seems that you would, would you agree with that? I think you can have the EU without NATO. The EU doesn't have a, a, a security arm. And do you need the, is this, I don't think this is the 19th century where you need the Marines to be able to make sure that the Germans and the French aren't going to fight. Uh, they're, they're not going to fight. Uh, it's, it, it, I, you can expand, it's a big question, is what if Ukraine joins the EU, will that make Putin as crazy as NATO expands? The answer is no, uh, because we wouldn't be pledging to die for NATO, for, um, for Ukraine, if the EU expands. And you know, it, it, it could make the like, economic threat's going to be different. Granted, there's a symbolic 
part of EU becoming, as you said, the European project. Yeah, that could that could make him more paranoid. Not anything like putting the U.S. security commitment there. What, what like to answer your question before about how what, what we should be prepared to do to stop Russians from expanding. Well, there's a lot of different things we can do, but once we expand NATO, we have said we're going to fight for it. And it cut and close it. Too many people, I think, uh, say we shouldn't bluff. I kind of like bluffing sometimes. But uh, once we expand that commitment, we're we're going to follow through on it. And it might be the case that Putin calls that bluff. We might end up fighting for it. Whoa, whoa what are we doing? And part of it is, you know, yeah, sure. The Russians are paranoid. They, they like to put together their uh, uh, empire in their near abroad. They can't do it. They can't take over the eastern part of Ukraine. Maybe in 10 years they can revamp their security effort. Probably not, though. But of course, the Bulgarians are going to say that. They don't want. They can't say, "Well, we're probably going to be fine," and have us stay. They want us to stay. Do we want to stay? Can I ask one first, and then we'll yeah. come around. That's right. Mm -hmm. Got time for a couple more questions. Um, you talked about the domestic environment mm -hmm. in Russia, mm -hmm. and said that uh, Putin is in a position where, if he were to retreat from the Donbass and a few of the other eastern oblasts, he would be in a domestic pickle. Yeah. But doesn't he control the domestic discourse? That's part yeah. of what, how I interpret the polling numbers that you rightly cited. Right. Where he's, uh, this is one of the liabilities of the Western position, which is Putin has displayed that he's, to a certain extent, immunized from yeah. legitimate criticism of how he's conducted the war. Yeah. But that means that if he did choose an end game that is less satisfactory than some that have been suggested, doesn't he have the latitude to sell it to his population in a since he's in a controlling political position. You're absolutely right. And uh, doesn't that open up a broader uh, spectrum of outcomes that might be acceptable and might be worth embracing some risk to pursue um, uh, as possible right. culminating resolutions? Hey, you're exactly right. He doesn't have to worry about his public. His audience costs aren't the Russian people. They're correctness people like this. This is this Chechen leader. This is the son of the original correctness Chechen's Chechen leader who uh, emerged in the Second Chechen War as their, he got assassinated, this guy took over. This guy's gonna get rid of him, not him himself, but the inner circle of uber hawks is who Putin would have to worry about. Not the people, the people, the Russian people are gonna rise up and get rid of him, but the hawks around him, and this is, a, this is not sort of my assessment, other people saying, look, if we get rid of, if Putin steps down, maybe things go well. Who knows? Or if he is removed or assassinated or there's all these rumors about him being ill. He's been ill since 1999 or so. <laughs> but if, if he does remove from the scene, somebody like this might come there. Not this guy, he's Chechen. But somebody like him might replace him. And somebody like him, a group of them might get rid of Putin because they are also, uh, they're the ones who he has to worry about what we call the audience costs. Not the Russian people. Like Prigozhin. I, I used to think Lebedev, Lebedev would be a moderate type of maybe if somebody, no, not Lebedev, what's the, what's the name of the uh, guy who was briefly the president? Medvedev. 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 Yeah, Medvedev. Did I do that? That's not right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Some Russian. I thought maybe he would be a voice of reason. Boy, he's, a, he's insane, more insane than the rest of them. They're tweeting while drunk all the time, apparently. But there's not a lot of voices of moderation saying, boy, maybe we should have rethought this plan. That's what he has to worry about. And not the people. Yeah, Jim. Yeah, my, my, my question was on kind of determination. You said, kind of, how does this end? It, yeah. end, it ends with Ukraine giving up a chunk of its territory. Yeah. But what would prevent Russia from licking its wounds, buying time, and then coming right back at it? I mean, right. the, the NATO, that's the whole point of the NATO piece, right? Yep. It's a deterrent. So how would you how would you kind of minimize the risk of, of you're, you're exactly right the russians have to come to the realization that they're not going to be able to take key mm -hmm. that they're, they're the west is not going to let that happen without enormous unpayable costs they, so that's where they have to get to and they're not there yet and the ukrainians have to get to the point where they say well maybe we should give up some land for our children children's future because the ukraine to come I forget the because the russian country. so you're right we the right it's not a one-way thing that the ukrainians have to get there the russians have to get to the point too which I think we're doing pretty well. That show that there are tremendous costs to be paid if you keep going, Vlad. And how much do the Chinese, how much are the Chinese going to stay on board with your uh, imperial ambitions here? And it also, you know, just NATO weaponry doing really well. 
These people say, oh, look at the weakness of the United States. What are you talking about? Have you been paying attention to how the war's going? Uh, it's, uh, so the Russians have to get there and they're not there. The Ukrainians have to get there and not there. It might take 10 years, but it's going to look a lot like that map. And you know, you know, I might be totally wrong, but I'll be gone a long time. And no, one will, you, you just won't be able to track me down. I'll get, <laughs> change my email. You won't play it. Uh, but that's what's going to, that's how it's going to end. It just it, tens of thousands are going to die before we get there. That's how it's going to end. Anyone else? That's going to be a big push for an encore. Okay. Keep on going. I know. No, no, you didn't pay for that much. <laughs> now we're 15. That's it. <laughs> Chris, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. On important issue where I think we all agree, constantly reassessing things that we believed and what's the right way for the future is very important. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thanks to people who joined us online. Uh, thanks for attending.